on this Thursday night, a starkly different version of events. There was no inappropriate pressure put on the minister at any time. This time from Canada's top civil servant, who says the former Minister of Justice was not pushed to intervene in the criminal case involving SNC-Lavalin. But why was she warned of the possible consequences for the company? At issue is here. We're not here to destroy the church, we're here to rewrite the course. Of, of the church. The Vatican looks at its dark history with an unprecedented summit on child sexual abuse. But will this actually lead to change? Jesse Smollett took advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. Plus, the perplexing actions of Jesse Smollett. Why would the American actor set up an attack on himself? And what would the motive be? This is The National. Canada's most powerful bureaucrat says he doesn't believe the former attorney general was pressured to settle the SNC-Lavalin criminal case. His statement was part of a remarkable exchange as the first witnesses caught up in this controversy begin to testify now in Ottawa. Michael Wernick is Canada's top civil servant and he delivered a sharp rebuke to accusations. His testimony offers new details on a story that has been shrouded in secrecy. Not only that, he also made unexpected comments about the state of public discourse in this country. We'll get political analysis of all of this with our At Issue panel a bit later, but we begin with David Cochran and the jaw-dropping session on Parliament Hill. The Justice Committee wants Jody Wilson-Raybould to speak her truth. Today, Michael Wernick spoke his. The Globe and Mail article contains errors, unfounded speculation, and in some cases is simply defamatory. In extraordinary Sorry, testimony, the clerk of the Privy Council offered public comment on private meetings that are part of a political scandal, service. giving a broad defense of the government he serves. And in my observation and my experience, they have always, always conducted themselves to the highest standards of integrity. You may not like their politics or their policies or their tweets, but they have always been guided by trying to do the right thing. Wernick also offered specific insights into key moments of the SNC-Lavalin timeline. Of note, he corroborated the Prime Minister's version of his September 17th meeting with Wilson-Raybould, during which Trudeau says he reassured her that she would make the final call on SNC-Lavalin. He indicated that it was entirely her call to make, that she was the decider. And that is a, that is a message... If you would, that is a message that the, the Prime Minister conveyed to the Minister on every situation even that I'm aware even of that it came decision. up. Wernick also released letters from December showing the Prime Minister turning down meetings with SNC's top brass, telling them to speak to Wilson-Raybould. At every opportunity, verbally and in writing in December, the Prime Minister made it clear that this was the decision for the Minister of Justice to take. But there is also a December 19th phone call Wernick made to Wilson-Raybould, a call that could be interpreted as pressure, a call in which Wernick mentioned SNC-Lavalin and consequences. I conveyed to her uh, that a lot of her colleagues and the Prime Minister were quite anxious, uh, was conveying context that there were a lot of people worried about what would happen, the consequences, not for her, the consequences for, for the workers and the communities and the suppliers. The question is whether that call was improper pressure or if Wilson-Raybould could interpret it that way. I think the matter may come down to the Ethics Commissioner's view on a conversation between two people between what was sent and what was received. The Ethics Commissioner is conducting a review, but the opposition has already reached a verdict. I think the testimony is stunning. I think the amount of pressure that the Prime Minister's office, either through his own operatives or through the clerk, the Privy Council, is incredibly unprecedented. Okay, David, there were certainly new details of what happened, maybe details for the first time, but there's still lots of gaps in all of this. Yeah, we still have nothing from Jody Wilson-Raybould, no specifics from her, though we expect that will change when she testifies at this committee next week. We expect that's going to happen on Tuesday, and we're clearly going to want her version of that September 17th meeting with the Prime Minister, her version of the December 19th call with the clerk, and how she perceived both of those events. And Rosie, there's another key event here we don't have anyone's version of, and that's a December 5th meeting between Wilson-Raybould 
Leopold and the Prime Minister's former top advisor, Jerry Butts, at the Chateau Laurier here in Ottawa. That has been highlighted as a key moment in this. Butts, in his resignation statement, says he has done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. We will obviously want to hear Wilson Raybould's version of what happened at that meeting. And Rosie, if you listen to Michael Wernick today, she should be able to be quite expansive on what she says because in his view, Wernick says solicitor-client privilege does not apply here at all. So in his view, Wilson Raybould should be free to speak her truth. We'll find out next week. And on it goes. David Cochran again on this story for us tonight in Ottawa. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, at the center of all this, at least today, is a man in a non-political job. Michael Wernick is the clerk of the Privy Council, as we've been saying, and some have criticized the non-partisan today of overstepping his role and being too partisan. But just what is his job and why is it important to our democracy? I occupy a position that has existed for almost 800 years. The King's counsellors and advisors. That is exactly what the Privy Council oath is, to be a true and faithful advisor to Her Majesty. The job of Canada's highest ranking and most powerful bureaucrat is to support the Prime Minister and Cabinet on policy and governance issues. Working with 900 other civil servants in the Privy Council office, the goal is to give advice to make sure the government runs properly. The non-partisan nature of Canada's public service is something Wernick spoke about when he became Clerk of the Privy Council in 2016. Our job is to do the very best we can uh, to deliver the agenda that, of the governments that Canadians elect, and that's the non-partisan support. Every government should be able to count on the public service to step up and work really hard to deliver the agenda that they put to Canadians. Indeed, governments of all stripes have counted on Wernick, a veteran civil servant. He joined the public service in 1981 when he was just 23. Before landing the job, Wernick was Deputy Minister for Indigenous Affairs. I worked very closely with, with three pri active prime ministers, former active ministers, a dozen ministers. I've seen cabinet meetings of uh, the Chrétien cabinet, the Mulroney cabinet, um, the, Harp the Martin cabinet, the Harper cabinet and the Trudeau cabinet. Michael Wernick also said he's deeply concerned about Canada's politics and where things are headed, even calling out some controversial comments he found particularly distasteful at a pro-pipeline rally on Parliament Hill this week. I know you've rolled all the way here, and I'm going to ask you one more thing. I want you to roll over every liberal left <laughs> in the country. That is Conservative Senator David Dukachuk addressing a convoy of mostly Alberta truckers who traveled to Ottawa. But comments like his, Wernick says, is why he's lamenting the state of political discourse in this country. It is unusual for a civil servant of his stature to speak so candidly. So here is Michael Wernick's opening statement for the record. I think there are a couple of things that need to be clarified. I worry about my country right now. I'm deeply concerned about my country right now and its politics and, its, and, and where it's headed. I worry about foreign interference in the upcoming election, and we're working hard on that. I worry about the rising tide of incitements to violence when people use terms like treason and traitor in open discourse. Those are the words that lead to assassination. I'm worried that somebody's going to be shot in this country this year during the political campaign. I think it's totally unacceptable that a member of the Parliament of Canada would incite people to drive trucks over people after what happened in Toronto last summer. Totally unacceptable, and I hope that you as parliamentarians are going to condemn that. I worry about the reputations of honourable people who have served their country being besmirched and dragged through the market square. I worry about the trolling from the vomitorium of social media entering the open media arena. Most of all, I worry about people losing faith in the institutions of governance of this country. And that's why these proceedings are so important. There were lots of uh, reaction and criticism even of that opening statement, Ian, but it was sure interesting to hear from his perspective. And obviously, it's a good night to have the Ad Issue gang on deck. Chantal, Andrew, and Shachi Curl are all here to talk about everything that happened today and this week, and that's in about 20 minutes. Can't wait. And Rosemary, we're going to move to another scandal now, one that has so many people around the world talking. <laughs> So much attention as Jesse Smollett posted bail today and walked out of a courthouse in Chicago and, reportedly, right back onto the set of his TV show, Empire. Earlier today, prosecutors laid out the case against Smollett in detail. In addition to orchestrating the attack on himself, they say Smollett sent himself a threatening letter before the assault. It contained a white powder that turned out to be aspirin. 
Also in the lead up to the attack, prosecutors say he texted one of his suspected accomplices the following, might need your help on the low. Smollett's tale of a racist homophobic assault was met with sympathy and support. Now, as Ellen Morrow reports, the reaction has turned to disappointment and resentment. Offended and angry, that's how Chicago's top cop described his feelings today. Jesse Smollett took advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. I will never be the man that this did not happen to. In this tearful account of the attack, Smollett described his assailants as homophobic, racist Trump supporters who shouted MAGA, make America great again. And that says a lot about the place that we are in our country right now. The fact that we have these fear mongrels, these people that are trying to separate us. By invoking America's deep divide, Smollett triggered a cultural moment. First, an outpouring of sympathy from celebrities and Democrats. He's a lovely person. No one deserves any of this. No. And it's, it's terrifying. No, it's scary. It's just scary. It's... Then backlash as the story started to unravel. It sounded like a fake story from the first second I heard it. That, I can tell you, is horrible. I've that was President Trump last month. Today, he taunted Smollett, tweeting, what about MAGA and the tens of millions of people you insulted? Smollett's initial defenders are now backing away. Democratic presidential hopeful Kamala Harris at first described him as a victim of an attempted modern-day lynching. Tonight, Harris tweeted that she's sad, frustrated, and disappointed. Was a wonderful person. Actress Sherry Shepard also supported Smollett originally. Now that we're finding out all of this other stuff, it's really terrible, but we cannot lose our humanity. And I want a little gay boy who might watch this to see that I fall back. That's what he said, but police say Smollett's alleged lies might make it harder for real victims to be believed. Sometimes you feel insecure. And all this for what? According to police, money. Smollett, they say, was seeking publicity to get a higher salary. The fallout, even deeper fissures in an already divided America. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. The production company behind Smollett's show, Empire, has been one of his strongest supporters, even yesterday, standing by the actor. But today there was a change in tone. 20th Century Fox says it's evaluating the situation and considering its options. Well, for the Catholic Church, it might just be the monster in the mirror, but now the Vatican says it's trying to stare it down. For decades, the church has covered up the sexual abuse of children by clergy. Today, an attempt at redemption. Pope Francis summoned 200 Catholic leaders from around the world for a four-day summit. The goal? to create a global plan to prevent abuse. He presented 21 proposals for bishops to consider on how to keep children safe, to investigate clergy and punish predators. The problem, as Thomas Degel explains, is the doors were closed to victims. At the Vatican, tourists always abound and rich history is in plain sight. Never before, though, has the heart of the Catholic Church tackled so openly its sinister side. This week, attracting a different kind of visitor. Oh, yeah. Survivors of clergy abuse now feeling emboldened, showing up even though they weren't invited. We're not here to destroy the church. We're here to rewrite the course of, of the church. The first time Leona Huggins came to Rome from British Columbia, she was still ashamed of the sexual assaults she had suffered at the hands of a priest. I was absolutely terrified, terrified being here. Um, even thinking about it, it's, it's, it brings back the emotion. If anything, this unprecedented global summit is helping survivors shake the taboo they lived with for too long. But what else will it achieve? The Pope told bishops the church needs concrete measures to fight sexual abuse. And that's where Canada might come in. Ever since the inquiry three decades ago into the notorious case of Newfoundland's Mount Cashel Orphanage, Canadian Catholics have been working to prevent clergy abuse. Yes, long before it became a worldwide concern. Most of the cases we have are cases from the past, you know, abuse, 
but uh, I'm not saying that there is nothing happening right now. Now, a strategy developed for Canadian bishops is being discussed at the Vatican as a model to follow elsewhere. It's a clear set of protocols to put victims first, though critics say there's little sign of that. Survivors aren't a part of the discussion, you know, we're, we're, we're lobbying outside. Gemma Hickey just got off the plane from St. John's, Newfoundland, eager to gain strength from meeting others who were also sexually abused by priests. Hickey's even hoping a personal letter to the Pope will lead to an audience with him. I don't know how the church is going to move forward by keeping the doors closed, by keeping us out of the discussion, and we're the ones that are affected by it. For now, survivors are leaning on each other, gaining the voices that went silent for years, and getting the support, they say, that never came from the church. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Rome. This subject generates some powerful emotions. This morning in Poland, hours before the summit opened, three men quietly toppled a statue of a priest honored for his anti-communist activism. He died in 2010 and has since been accused of being a predator. The vandals placed children's underwear and an altar boy's garment on the statue to symbolize the suffering of children. Now, Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette spoke yesterday with CBC News. Here's a bit more of what he had to say about the sexual abuse of children by priests. We were not aware uh, 25 years ago of the, the, the depth of the pain and the consequences of these abuse on, on children. For example, we thought, you know, that so with some uh, 25 years ago, with some correction, it was possible to, to uh, return to ministry. In fact, we've learned that it is much uh, more serious than we expected. And, and so now, uh, when it is submitted and somebody is convicted, uh, he, he is expelled from ministry, you know, when you have a real case of pedophile. In recent months, about half of U.S. Catholic dioceses have tallied up lists of credible accusations of abuse against priests and others in the church. The total exceeds 2,600 accused predators over the decades. That's not victims, that's abusers. The church in Canada hasn't released numbers, but a blog called Sylvia's Site tracks accusations through news reports and court records. It lists 373 Canadian clergy. Here's some other stories we're following tonight. The federal government and First Nations leaders have signed an interim deal to fix dozens of homes in the remote indigenous community of Cat Lake in Northern Ontario. Right now, you know, we're going through the process of determining which ones we demolish, to be honest with you, and, and build new ones in their place, and which ones we can renovate and repair. And that now begins uh, full throttle. Last month, the community declared a state of emergency over dangerously inadequate housing that was leading to health issues. Earlier this week, a woman from the community died and her family says mold infestation was a contributing factor. Ottawa is looking to help that Halifax mother who lost all seven of her children in a house fire. The immigration minister may speed up the process to move Cowther Barho's brother and mother to Canada from Lebanon. A local MP is helping put together their applications. He met with Barho today at the hospital where her husband remains in a medically induced coma. That's her only close family support in Canada right now. Um, and so she needs people here quickly to, to be around her. The Prime Minister was in Halifax today and said, while the immigration system is based on rules and procedures, it is also compassionate. And still ahead on The National, more on the nationwide efforts to show support for the Barho family, how another Syrian refugee is stepping up. Plus, today's Justice Committee meeting surprised the At Issue gang, so stick around for their takes. And a startling marketplace investigation about a scam designed to get and use your information. That's your SIN number. Mm -hmm. That's your credit card number. You could actually keep on using this information, reselling this information online. How it works straight from the mouth of a former scammer. Next. If you get a phone call from someone offering to help cut your credit card interest rate for a fee, heads up, because this could be a serious scam. Canada's anti-fraud unit says it receives about 300 of these types of complaints every year. 
But the latest marketplace investigation found there could be a lot more than a few hundred victims of this scam out there. They have obtained a leaked list from one call centre that shows there have been thousands of Canadian victims. And as Magda Gabrasalasa explains, the damage can be difficult to stop. Hi, are you Fernanda? Yeah. Hi. We're going door to door, letting people know they're victims of identity theft. They're on a list used by criminals. That's your SIN number. Mm -hmm. That's your credit card number. The list leaked to Marketplace contains close to 3,000 names, victims of a low interest scam. This is one of the call centers in Pakistan where it takes place. And this is how it goes. Carol, this is Ronnie in the verifications department. And it sounds like they're calling from a credit card company. There's an offer to reduce your interest rate for a fee, but it's a scam. And it's about more than that one time payout. It's about fishing for profitable information. And the expiration date. Huge. In Winnipeg, Grace Johnston knows firsthand what happens after the phone call. The Royal Bank sent me, you know, a letter saying, come pick up your credit card, and I hadn't applied for one. She says she alerted her bank. She got a new credit card and yeah. thought it was behind her. But she's on our list, too. My credit information is out there, and um, it keeps coming back to haunt me. According to a former fraudster, it could keep happening. You could actually keep on using this information, reselling this information online. Mohammed Yusfi used to run the low interest scam at a call center in Pakistan. He says the information he gathered. It could actually be used to refinance their houses, their mortgages, their cars, um, clean their bank accounts. How can victims fight back? Here in Canada, Equifax and TransUnion, the two credit reporting bureaus, offer some protections. But Yusfi says one of the best protections is not offered here. It's a credit freeze. It gives the consumer the power to lock down a credit file with the bureaus, so fraudsters can't open new accounts. That would actually be a huge, a huge uh, blow to the uh, lower interest rate credit card scammers. Credit freezes are offered in the U.S. for free, but not in Canada. For victims like Grace, it doesn't add up. If they can do it in the States, why can't they do it in Canada? Ontario was working on it. There was legislation that would require credit bureaus to offer credit freezes. But once the new government came in, it stalled. We asked the minister in charge of consumer protections, what's the holdup? He says his office is exploring the topic and looking into options on how to strengthen consumer protections. Magda Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Toronto. So that's just a glimpse of what the team at Marketplace uncovered. You can watch their full investigation tomorrow night on CBC Television starting at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland. Still ahead on The National, it may sound like a spin-off of the Jetsons, but service job robots apparently are here to stay. We'll show you who they're displacing. Hopefully not TV news anchors. Plus, there's <laughs> some pretty major news from Ottawa to talk about. Thank goodness for these guys. At Issue is next. Three, two, one, zero. Welcome back. We're watching a historic moment unfold. With this launch, Israel is on its way to land its first space probe on the moon. This was the scene in Florida earlier tonight as the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket blasted off. It is carrying an Israeli lunar lander that's expected to arrive on the moon in April. There's another shakeup in the world of retail. Hudson's Bay Company says it's shutting down home outfitters in Canada. The company announced today all 37 stores will close by the end of the year. A possible class action suit against WestJet by some employees is a step closer. The BC Court of Appeal today upholding a previous decision that refused to throw out the lawsuit. Former flight attendant Mandalina Lewis says the airline broke its promise to provide a harassment-free workplace for women. Lewis is hoping the class action will be certified within the next year. Should Canadians be concerned about the rule of law in this country? No. The Globe and Mail article contains errors, unfounded speculation, and in some cases is simply defamatory. 
there was no inappropriate pressure put on the minister at any time. I am quite sure the minister felt pressure to get it right. Part of my conversation with her on December 19th was conveying context that there were a lot of people worried about what would happen. Canada's top civil servant sharing some strong words with the Justice Committee today. Michael Wernick, the clerk of the Privy Council, says there was no unlawful or inappropriate pressure placed on Jody Wilson-Raybould. So what should we make of his testimony? Are we any closer, for instance, to understanding what actually happened? At issue, back for the second time this week, Chantal Hébert returns, and she is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto, and Chachi Curl joins us from Vancouver tonight. Good to see everybody. Uh, we, we almost did a third at issue this week, I must admit, but I... <laughs> I told them you might need a break. Um, so what, I mean, it was pretty extraordinary to hear the, uh, the clerk of the Privy Council give this, uh, you know, very adamant uh, testimony about how things unfolded, certainly added lots of details to the things that we had heard. Let me just get your first impressions, if I can, and I'll start with you, Chantal, on, on what was important to you in terms of what Wernick said. Well, to start off with what maybe was not the most important, the Justice mm -hmm. Committee did not turn into a partisan circus yes. uh, and allowed people to speak out. What, I, what was new was that for once someone with his face on what he was saying was speaking in complete sentences and answering questions. So that's new. It's mm -hmm. not someone whispering or someone throwing a line in, in a scrum. Uh, I think what I took from it, uh, the first thing is that there are three people who uh, spoke to Jody Wilson-Raybould in that adventure, uh, the Prime Minister, Jerry Butts, and the clerk. And all three, you can expect now, are on the same page. Uh, they all felt that they were not do crossing any lines in what they were doing, and yes, they did speak with her. That is also clear from testimony. Uh, and what I took, uh, what makes Mr. Uh, Warnick different from the other two is that no longer can you say some uh, political operator gone rogue on the orders of the Prime Minister across the line because he, the clerk of the Privy Council's job is to tell the Prime Minister and Jerry Butts whether, where the lines are. Yes. Uh, yes. So if you feel that the, the Prime Minister and Jerry Butts cross the line, then the, the top civil servant, backed with the advice of the civil service, uh, also crossed that line. Okay, so in terms of his, the, the counsel that he was giving, uh, Andrew, because that's, that's primarily his job, not only to sort of make sure they're, they're governing properly, but also to, to give advice in order to help them implement their policy agenda. Do you view that as something that he should not have done or something that Jody Wilson-Raybould could have interpreted as pressure? Well, he, I guess what I came with, is he's, he's moving the line. Uh, initially, we were talking about whether anybody was directed or not, and the Prime Minister, that was his line. Then, sotto voce, behind the scenes, people in the Prime Minister's office, unnamed, would say, well, we didn't, we, we didn't put any pressure on her. He wouldn't say that, but they said it. We never put any pressure on her. Mm -hmm. Now we're hearing we, we didn't put inappropriate pressure on her. Uh, so we're moving closer and closer, it seems to me, to the point where you say, well, maybe we pressured her, but we were okay in doing so because we had these important uh, objectives we wanted to achieve. So we're moving the line from what was previously unimaginable and quite improper to, well, it's maybe a gray area, maybe not so improper. I also found a lot of his testimony strange. That statement off the top when he talked about, you know, people are going to get shot in campaigns and a bunch of stuff that was not germane to this issue whatsoever. And some of the commentary, frankly, sounded like he was cheerleading for the government. So it was an odd day and an odd performance uh, all around. But look, he's also one of the people that Jody Wilson-Raybould, it seems, is going to suggest had inappropriately pressured her. Um, so yeah, he's, he clearly was contradicting that. What, what, what did you take from it, Shachi? Oh, it's unprecedented. So first of all, you know, the idea of a clerk, the clerk of the Privy Council, this is supposed to be this, this eminence grease in, in background, having difficult and, and maybe testy or, or four-letter word conversations in background. It's not supposed to come out in public. Uh -huh. And so to hear uh, Mr. Warnick swinging for the fences today really did catch my eye. The other piece of it, though, is that, you know, a lot of what he was saying, a lot of it of what Mr. Lametti was talking about, if you just looked at it sort of in a vacuum, oh yes, it, it could be seen as very reasonable. We didn't mean to pressure. The intent wasn't to pressure. We can't speak to, to what Jody Wilson-Raybould took away from those conversations. The intent wasn't there. But of course, that doesn't explain 
why she was dropped from cabinet. So that that is the piece that, that sticks with me and, and the circle that doesn't square. And I think that is what a lot of people who are watching this from outside the Beltway are taking away, which is, okay, all, all of the, the recasting of the tone and the tenor mm -hmm. of these three conversations uh, may go some way to, to, to appear to smooth things over, but of course, at the end of the day, this is very much about the appearance of a raw exercise of power. You didn't do what we wanted, Jody Wilson-Raybould, you're out. And, and it, we don't it, have yeah. a good explanation for uh, why. So, Chant Chantel, then, but, Andrew, Chantel, then, Andrew. Yeah. But, but there, that's, it also opens up a question that I, I personally have had for, since the beginning. And, and I think anyone who is on principle left a job to resist pressure uh, to one's independence would understand why that question would be there. If you feel you're unduly pressured, why would you not resign? And if you feel that you are confirmed in your suspicion, if it's only a suspicion by being offered a demotion, why would you not resign? Why would you do nothing about it? And question, if the Globe and Mail hadn't come out with a story based on anonymous uh, sources, would uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould still be a Minister of Veterans yeah. Affairs? Andrew. Uh, those are certainly questions worth uh, answering. Another question is why, if, if, if you can understand if there was maybe a, a misinterpretation, uh, you know, people had, had different ideas about what was intended. Right. See, maybe she gets that mistaken impression at the time. Right. Why would she still have that impression today and have that impression so strongly it appears that she was willing to resign from cabinet over it? Uh, it, it, that doesn't seem to me to add up. That, that if it, once you've explained to her, listen, Ms. Yeah. Wilson Rabel, that's not what we intended at all. Yeah. If she's not taking that as, as sincere, there's probably worth finding out why. Well, and, and but, it's, it but, does but, seem but, like she had to be reassured on that point multiple times by the prime minister, the clerk, and others that the decision was hers. And so, to your point, and, and why, was, uh, why uh, be reassured? Yeah. And at the end of the day, she did take the yes. decision, and yes. then yes. Uh, it feels certainly, I guess, that she took a hit for it. So yes. it, but, it sounds uh, like she had weeks of meetings in which people were laying on, quote unquote, appropriate pressure on her. Um, and there's real questions as to whether any of those conversations should really have happened. People keep invoking the quote-unquote Shawcross doctrine, which yeah. is that, a, that the Attorney General can go and solicit advice yes. from her cabinet colleagues. That's a very different thing than people, the Prime Minister calling her in or, or sending Jerry Butts to meet her or sending uh, Michael Warnick to meet her. Those are very different uh, uh, types of situations. Yeah, except, except we also found out today that those meetings, the Prime Minister meeting, the Clerk meeting, were actually about different issues, where there was already a problem between... Sure. Uh, My point her, is unsolicited yeah. advice fine, fine. Okay. is a very different thing than um, solicited okay, advice. Okay, I want I want to just, I want to play the clip of Jody Wilson-Raybould, though, so that we can k talk a little bit more about her, but I think it's important to play this clip again, because I, it, it left me with a lot of questions again yesterday about where we are. So here, here's what she said yesterday in the House. I understand fully that Canadians want to know the truth and want transparency. Privilege and confidentiality are not mine to waive, and I hope that I have the opportunity to speak my truth. I mean, that went off like, you, you know, everyone was stunned by that. What, what, what do we take from that? I'll start with you, Shachi, and then, and then go through everybody. Well, it says to me, and I think Canadians take from it, and we've seen from two out of three polls released this week, that, that they are not entirely satisfied with whatever explanations are being proffered, and that there is more to come, or there is a sense of we're not quite there yet. So mm -hmm. there's like the stink factor, and then there's the stick factor. The stink factor is, is what the Liberal government, despite sort of using all the air freshener in the can this week, have not been able to make go away. The, the next question is, how how long does this last? And we have seen over the last three days a steady drip, drip, drip of everything's fine, oh, bombshell. Everything's okay, uh, new information, new allegations, new things coming out. So uh, clearly, Jody Wilson Raybolt has a truth to tell. Uh, that truth does not look like it bodes well or augurs well for this Liberal government because at the end of the day, she still appears to be at odds with whatever happened, uh, whether it was legal or over a line or under a line. And again, I, I take 10 steps back and say, well, okay, what do people, what do voters in an election year take away from yeah. this? And, and they take away from the fact that, look, this is a government that campaigned on being uh, clean and doing government differently and more respectfully and more transparently. Okay. And they can't, they can't see they don't see that right now. It's not on brand. Yes, well, yeah. voters 
the, the expression my truth uh, i think today is clearer than than it was even yesterday uh, Voters are going to have to choose between the word of the Prime Minister, the Clerk of the Privy Council, and Jerry Butts versus hers, clearly. Yep. Uh, her version is not going to match theirs, uh, and theirs are going to be similar. Uh, and voters will have to judge. I'm not sure that the test of truth is that she says the same thing as they do or that they say as she does. I don't think it's that clear. Uh, and I think by now she's well aware that her perception is not going to be confirmed by any of the other players in those exchanges. Or, or even worse, Andrew, she goes in next week and she tells pretty much the same version of events, but it's through her lens where she feels she's been pressured. And then I don't know how you figure out what happened, if it's a very similar version, because it's just well, one person's view of it, is it not? First thing to point out is that when, when she came out of that cabinet meeting, a lot of there was a lot of talk about there had been some rapprochement. Now, well, yes, that's clearly yes. not the case. We've since learned that they made her wait for two hours before they yeah. allowed her in. That when she was in there, she did tell them that she felt she'd been inappropriately pressured. And then the cabinet, having heard that, then trotted out and voted against having a public inquiry into this. So that implicates a lot more than just Jerry Butts and the prime minister. We now have cabinet ministers who know what she knows or what she's told them she knows and have acted as they have acted. I do think it, it, that it, it, even if it's, frankly, even if it's on Michael Wernick's account, when you work through what they were asking her to do, so was she going to go and, and direct the director of public prosecutions to drop the charges against uh, SNC Lab on grounds of the economic impact it would do, that's actually not allowed under the law. And there's several reasons to think that SNC Lab was actually not eligible for that special treatment. So it, it, I don't think people have kind of worked through exactly how many steps would have to fall into place for this simple act, supposedly, of acting the, asking the Attorney General to intervene, for that act actually to translate into anything that SNC Lavalin or the government actually wanted to happen here. I don't think they fully thought this through, frankly. Chantal, um, again. Just one word. I am not concluding that people vote against the public inquiry or that the debate over whether a public inquiry is one necessary and be the appropriate vehicle based on what they heard from Jody Wilson-Raybould at the cabinet meeting. There are a host of reasons to think long and hard before setting up public inquiries. I got to go. Uh, I, I'm gathering we're going to talk about this some more. So <laughs> don't fear not. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're talking about the other story that rolled through Ottawa this week. Probably didn't get the attention that it would have normally, but the convoy. So look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, don't get any bright ideas, Rosie. I could listen to them all day, though. Coming up right after the break, Kim Brunhuber explores the robot revolution as they jump from the assembly line to the coffee line. It has like uh, several different dance routines. <laughs> is this the future? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious it is. Yeah. The robot apocalypse is a staple of science fiction, but in real life, the rise of machines isn't about the end of the world. It's about the end of some types of work as we know it. Robots are getting smarter and the consequences hard to predict. Who loses their jobs? Which industries are vulnerable when employers go droid? Kim Brunhuber shows us and the answer may surprise you. At this Los Angeles hotel, a guest just called for room service. She wants a ginger ale. So the front desk clerk summons the bellhop, Wally. At only three feet tall, he's a model employee. Works 24-7 with no breaks for free. Wally is, of course, a robot. Programmed to interact with guests and to deliver things to rooms. Hi, Wally. Latasha McDowell says it's like having R2-D2 show up at your door. All set. And he doesn't expect a tip. What do you think? This is very cool. I love it. <laughs> Yay! Wally is a service robot, loosely defined as a robot that performs useful tasks for humans in a non-industrial setting, like a home or a store. A recent study by a Washington think tank suggested automation will threaten a quarter of U.S. jobs. This has many workers wondering, will a robot replacement be coming for them? 
And the irony is you would think because the robots, it would be cheaper, but the drinks are actually twice as expensive. So. If you were a fan of the Tom Green show, you might recognize Phil Giroux as Green's former sidekick, now a director with an Ottawa-based IT company. He and a couple of colleagues came to this Las Vegas bar for a drink. Here at the Tipsy Robot, the two bartenders can't listen to your troubles, but they will mix your drink in 90 seconds or less. Cheers, everyone, to the future uh, robot drinks. But seeing this technology at work for the first time, Giroux fears the future is bleak for many in the service sector. If you're in the uh, bartending industry, look out. The bar's general manager says human bartenders needn't worry. This robot isn't a threat. It's not going to take jobs because they cannot still work without human. We still need human to just to make sure that everything is going OK. For instance, these bartenders need humans to change their bottles, but already the company is working on a new model that can solve many of these challenges. And these rapid advances in robotic technology could have profound implications for the labor force. Some people say this is a bit like walking a dog. David Crawley is the founder of a robotics company that designed Magni. The robot has a neural net which is a little bit like a human brain. Find person. And it's just found you and it's driving up to you. This robot is like a building block that can be easily modified to do different jobs. A robotic porter, for instance. Or a robot cocktail waiter. Crawley says the technology is advancing so quickly, robots could eventually be doing a lot of the work Canadians are doing now. As a roboticist, I, that would be my, my wildest fantasy. You're, you're rooting for the robot. <laughs> I'm rooting for the robot, right? You know, I mean, they're able to move things from one place to another. They're able to interact with objects and do the sorts of things that, that humans can do. And, you know, that's going to displace human work. You know, receptionists, secretaries, people that, that do things in offices are going to be the, the next area that I think robots are going to displace. On a street corner in San Francisco, Cafe X, the only coffee shop in America run by a robot. It's a very friendly robot. It has like a, several different dance routines. <laughs> the robot's young inventor says employees can focus on customers instead of the boring task of actually making the coffee. But in an unusually frank admission, he concedes by using robots, the business is able to reduce one of its highest costs. Certainly it gives us uh, the flexibility to sort of adjust the amount of labor we have on site because, you know, the kind of basic functionality of making drinks is done by a robot. So that is one of the things that makes it more economical for us to like scale really quickly. Researchers suggest in 20 years, roughly 90% of jobs in the food preparation industry could be done by robots. Is this the future? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious it is, yeah. Back at this Los Angeles hotel, Wally has finished his deliveries. Need anything? Dial zero from your room, it'll bring it to you. Right now, Wally and many other service robots aren't actually vital to the bottom line, more like a novelty to draw customers. Hashtag Wally. <laughs> Chances are you will eventually have a robotic colleague at work, but it's unlikely you will actually be replaced anytime soon. After all, customers still need human interaction, and robots still need us. For now. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Okay. Next on The National, our moment. Why one man who fled Syria for Canada is leading the charge to help the Barho family. As a Syrian community, we felt that we had the responsibility uh, to, uh, to show kindness and love. We always say that love is the answer and hate is the cancer. Now this, this is Vandal Donuts in Halifax today. All those people are lining up for something very sweet indeed. You see, Vandal is selling treats and all the proceeds go to the Barho family. Syrian refugees who lost all seven children in that deadly house fire earlier this week. Vandal wasn't just selling donuts, it was offering chocolate bars made by someone who also fled violence in Syria. Chocolatier Tarek Haddad's sadness over the Barho's tragedy comes with the kinship of knowing what they escaped. His gesture and his reaction is tonight's moment. 
you know, this whole story connects on, on so many levels to us. Um, uh, at the end of the day, my family has lost everything back home in Syria. It, it's always really important since we came here in 2016 and we really felt, you know, what does it mean to lose everything in a blink of an eye? We were reached out by uh, Vandal Donuts in Halifax and we were looking for a supplier and a vendor in, in the city because we are two hours away from the family. I would really love to thank everyone that they believed in what they are doing, that they believed in the kindness of uh, of Canadians all across the country. As a Syrian community, we felt that we had the responsibility uh, to uh, to show kindness and love. We always say that love is the answer. As a Syrian here in Nova Scotia, as a Syrian here in Canada, I really want to thank everyone who really offered help and support to the family. And uh, we really just want to make sure that uh, uh, we continue the support for for the days to come. This reminds me so much of the Humboldt story. Every time I see the pictures of those kids, it just, uh, it's, it's so hard. And you think about the intense pain that the parents will feel. And, uh, and, and I think it's nice that there's at least this collective ritual of grief that people can, can take part in. In this case, something as simple as just buying a, buying a donut. Well, because you don't know what to do, right? You really don't know what to do for these parents in particular. And Tarek Haddad was saying to one of our producers earlier today that his grandfather always told him that the hardest thing, that immigration is the hardest part, transition in someone's life. And that so he is really feeling for them on, on so many levels right now. Yeah, it's good to see an outpouring of support. They'll need it more in the days ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's The National for Thursday, February 21st. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hey.